It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 330 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 8th of April 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is geneticist and marine biologist Dr. Kate Norton. Hello. And composer and sound designer Peter Miller. Hello. And before we start, a quick reminder for everyone to go to scienceontop.com slash donate. If you want to help us make the show, just chip in a few dollars each episode. Goes a long way for keeping the bills paid and us on the air, as they used to say, in radio land. And I still say that. They do, but in radio land. <laughs> but I think we should probably start off with an article in The New Yorker written by Douglas Preston, because it is so good, and we, we really cannot do it justice, I don't think, but we should try. Peter, it's an in-depth look at what happened 65 million years ago when an asteroid between 15 and 80 kilometers in diameter struck the Yucatan Peninsula and probably led to the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. The article is called The Day the Dinosaurs Died, but it really, it's about the hour that the dinosaurs died because (laughs) of an incredible, if true, discovery, isn't it? Yeah, look, the thing is that there's a fair bit of controversy about this uh, this idea of what happened to the dinosaurs and, and the, the prevailing wisdom uh, has been up until recently that uh, it, it, when the asteroids struck, and we know the asteroids struck, we have actual geological evidence that that happened, um, it was kind of like the death knell but possibly not the uh, uh, defining event of of the time. Um, But this discovery makes it look like it possibly was the defining event and that that the dinosaurs weren't really on their way out, as many people had had thought over a period of uh, hundreds of thousands or even perhaps a million years. But uh, this this event might have actually been the thing that caused the the extinction. So it's uh, it's quite fascinating. uh, If if it's if it uh, you know accumulates enough evidence for us to think that uh, it is it is actually true, I actually find this. Um, sorry for not interrupting a, a stream of going. No, no, go ahead. The thing that I find really interesting about this um, particular piece is that um, not being a paleontologist, um, when things were aren't extant anymore, I stop. I stop trying <laughs> to get their DNA because um, it just it just doesn't work. It's no good. Um, I was under the impression that it was just accepted wisdom that the um, the asteroid mm. knocked out the dinosaurs, more or less. Uh, so discovering that, that that theory was only really being started to push, uh, the you know, in 1980, it was like a year before I was born, um, it was actually quite a surprise to me that it was that recent. Um, and it always reminds me of how um, how quickly these these things change when we're looking at something on geological time scale and our ideas obviously are just changing so much faster yeah. than that doesn't even compare. Sure. Um, yeah. And so I thought, thought that was interesting and then especially coming to the idea that if the dinosaurs were on the way out and they thought they were on the way out because there was a gap in the fossil record, um, it was a very wide, very particular and very specific gap. Um, and yeah. that's, that's it's an interesting... It's an interesting idea, sort of, I mean, there's not a lot you can do when you've got a negative, right? You've got a lack of evidence for a particular period and for something that's yes. as patchy as the fossil record. You're kind of standing on one leg, balancing carefully to try and use that as evidence. Well, it's the old, um, a lack of evidence is not evidence of absence, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, is, I think a, the, the problem arises from the fact that, you know, the, the wiping out of the dinosaurs by a single event seemed to be, um, it was popular for a while. Uh, but then, you know, on reflection, people started to look at the fossil record and they thought, well, maybe that's just something that we've, we've kind of jumped to a conclusion of, but maybe that's not the case. Uh, and then, then diving back into the fossil record, start to look at it and go, well, yeah, you know what, we can't really definitively say that that's what happened. Um, but this discovery might actually say we can definitively say that. And that's what 
that's what's very interesting about it, yeah. Mm. No, so basically, um, if you – sorry, did you have more to say on – no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I just, um, just to you know, to put it in, to to frame it in the way that you know it's it's been kind of uh, approached over the last yeah. uh, few decades, so that yeah. there's some kind of context for it. Mm. Well, yeah, and like I said, as a you know, just a child growing up in the age of the Land Before Time movies, um, I of course was exposed to extremely precise animated evidence of <laughs> what happened to the dinosaurs. Uh, so. Um, well, I found this particularly good. I mean, I mean, it's a it's a New Yorker article, so it's basically a novel. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's it's beautifully it's, written, yeah. and I highly recommend it. Um, There's so many things have changed. I mean, as you say, you know, in, in a very short period of time, our, our ideas about what happened um, in in that uh, certainly, you know, in the Jurassic period and before have changed significantly. I mean, when I was when I was young, I mean, I remember reading stuff about. I re- remember reading Robert Backer's book, uh, where he is highly conjecturally saying that perhaps uh, theropod dinosaurs are birds. They are actually the progenitors of birds. At that time, it was actually seen to be kind of radical. And now, of course, we, we accept that. We actually accept that that is, in fact, the case. But when Robert Backer wrote his first book suggesting that, um, he was seen as a little bit of a heretic. Uh, and I remember that. I remember that, that period of time. So things change very rapidly. And then getting back to popular media, which is fascinated by dinosaurs and always mm-hmm. will be, um, you know, you get that bird uh, bird dinosaur relationship being sort of just like hypothetically kind of gently introduced in you know Jurassic Park, mm, yeah, um, where it's you know a key fragment of a joke, and then gets kind of extremely creepy later on when you do start to draw the yeah. the parallels. And um, well, that but, Sam Neill character in Jurassic Park is actually based on Robert Backer, so you know there's a kind of a link through there. <laughs> oh, I figured it was fairly deliberate, <laughs> yeah. uh, deliberate, a deliberate nod, um, and and a very well done one as well. But because um, they were just talking about um, Archaeopteryx. Uh, when I was in primary school, yeah, um, yeah. they've now very much expanded on that uh, degree. Yep. Feathered um, dinosaurs are, are definitely something that we now say. Yep, extremely that's avian. Probably, probably likely. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And it's great in this particular discovery, uh, one of the things that um, uh, they talk about, uh, this is a discovery made by paleontologist um, Robert De Palma, uh, where he's found a very, very thin strata of uh, material that looks like something happened very rapidly and has re- has preserved certain kinds of uh, things, a whole lot of things in a particular way that makes the suggestion uh, that what we're seeing here is a rapid event that happened very, very quickly. Uh, and one of the things that that he's very excited to have found is feathers. There oh, are yeah. actual feathers, and that's an amazing thing because you know he's suggesting these these are big feathers. They belong to big creatures, and that's great. I mean, that's so amazing. Yeah. So previously, it was a sort of an interpretive uh, sort of approach with, with the fossils, and he was saying, "Oh yes, this is my ninth feather," and getting very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> would you would you start to get a bit blasé after a while? I don't know. Um, but the thing that I, I like is that um, the gap in the fossil record that caused this kind of controversy and debate was very much around uh, that KT boundary, so that um, that black layer, which which marks the demarcation before what we call the Paleogene, which is um, one of the, the more recent ge- uh, geological era. And just it's just known that there's just a gap there where there's just not a lot of data and not a lot of fossilization. Mm. And that that always stands out to me when you get um, when you get a notoriously specific sampling gap, my ears just prick up and just go, mm. oh, okay, mm. something's Something going unusual. on. Why is, why is that yeah. happening? Is there some sort of underlying systemic uh, reason for that? Um, and just the way I mean, the article is written very well because it explains the KT boundary and how it all happens and so forth very dramatically. Um, and then says, aha, we found it. The whole site is the KT boundary. <laughs> and and then my other ears break up and go, oh, okay, but but, but steady on, steady on. Um, are, are we sure? Um, so I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of controversy around this. And one thing that is also raised by the article, depending on whether we want to talk about change of, change of ideas, how the, di- how the dinosaurs actually died, or what look like some unusual issues around access and sort of contractual requirements where it comes to 
access to the land, access to the site, the location of the site, what are the details mm. of how often he's allowed to go there and sample it and so forth and so on. Um, and especially with something as controversial as this where you, you, you want to maintain a certain amount of um, secrecy, discretion is probably a better word, secrecy makes it sound very um, Cold War, are starting to wonder how is this going to be validated essentially. Yeah. Hmm. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, it, this is a this is a very richly um, uh, written article, and it and it's very exciting because it, it, it you have a very large amount of enthusiasm for this kind of thing if you if you're interested in the dinosaurs and that period of history. But um, I think you know, as with all science, uh, it, it does require that we we are a little bit patient and just see what other people have to say, um, because you, you know the KT boundary and the event that happened is not represented in only one place it's going to be across a very large part of the world so um, we can expect that if if um, De Palma is actually right there must be evidence elsewhere that will support that well it does from the description of the place like the a very specific sort of uh, wetland site I suspect that you probably need uh, a constellation of very specific conditions mm. uh, for that to occur so it should definitely ideally exists somewhere else, uh, but whether that place is going to be somewhere that someone's going to be looking for fossils or someone's just going to put in a dam yep. is another issue. But it gives them uh, a place, it gives them something to look at now. That's the thing, you know, that now we now we know kind of there is a suggestion that this might be the case, so we know we can look for that. Um, and I that's think that, true. that's probably the next step because... Um, you can start, yeah, you can start a targeted search once you've got those kinds of parameters yeah. in place. Yeah. Which is really yeah. exciting, actually. I've got, like, to read, more, more. I've, I've got to read this little part out of the out of the New Yorker, though, which just is just such an amazing, um, amazing description of of the actual event, because um, it, it, because it kind of it, it's just frightening in, in its in its way. Okay, so um, this is the description that that they give as to what happened. It says, picture the splash of a pebble falling into a into pond water, but on a planetary scale. When Earth's crust rebounded, a peak higher than Mount Everest briefly rose up. The energy released was more than that of a billion Hiroshima bombs, but the blast looked nothing like a nuclear explosion with its signature mushroom cloud. Instead, the initial blowout formed a rooster tail, a gigantic jet of molten material which exited the atmosphere, some of it fanning out over North America. Much of the material was several times hotter than the surface of the sun, and it set fire to everything within a thousand miles. Uh, they then go on to say that this ejector actually went further out into the into the solar system. It might even have re reached Titan and Europa, which I think is just incredibly astonishing. Yeah, that got to me as well. Moons around Saturn and Jupiter. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so, so you, you know, we we now face the very real prospect that. This is the case, and we did, for instance, fire, find uh, uh, life on Europa, one of my pet things. Yeah. Uh, it could have come from Earth, yeah. <laughs> which is just really yeah. extraordinary. It's an amazing description. Okay, and so this site that uh, Robert De Palma has been looking at, it's in um, it's the, the Hell Creek Formation, I think. Yeah, of course uh, it's called Hell <laughs> I don't know if that's a description of the working conditions so much <laughs> that he was working under, but uh, it's this in is uh, was it North Dakota? North Dakota, think, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, just near Bowman, North Dakota, and of course by now this land is no longer like during the Bone Wars uh, when we were originally finding all the dinosaur bones when a lot of it was public land and everything. These are people's farms and ranches, and you actually mm. have to get permission to go digging on it and things like that. And it, it's an expensive operation. You've got to remember, this guy is not... He hasn't finished his PhD yet. He's got an unpaid job as a curator at a museum. He's scrimping and saving where he can for money to get the expensive um, glue that holds fossils together when you do extract mm. them. Yeah. But he's found this incredible site. And Peter, do you want to tell us sort of what exactly he's finding there and what makes it so special? Uh, I think he he talks about how when he first uh, when he first started to become excited by the site, 
he noticed these tiny little specks in the layers of, of where he was ex- where he was excavating. He looked at them um, under the microscope, and he he determined that they were things called microtectites, which are tiny little bits of molten rock. Uh, and the the supposition is that this was a, a result of the huge temperatures that were, were um, generated when the, the asteroid hit, uh, blasting this stuff into the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, then it kind of come, comes raining down as these tiny little pieces of molten rock uh, all across the surface of, of the planet, uh, certainly close to, to where the impact hap- happened. And this is what started him thinking, hang on a minute, this is really interesting. Well, molten rock, why is there all this molten, why is this, these little fine particles of molten rock? Uh, and that's what started him to get very excited about uh, looking at this, this little um, segment. Once he started looking down it, he just found very dense um, combinations of plant material, of bones, of all kinds of things, all in this very, very s- relatively small and thin layer, which uh, implied that all this stuff happened very quickly. He's very, very excited, obviously. Uh, yeah. The problem comes, though, as I said, he's he doesn't have a PhD. He's a bit of a nobody in the paleological world uh and that's an uphill battle for someone to get recognition and to get people to take you seriously for this um which is i think kind of interesting that he managed to get an article written up about it in the new yorker and someone that's as detailed and comprehensive as this it's certainly become uh it's quoted i saw it a couple happen a couple of places in in my various feeds so it's sparked interest there's no question at all about that and also you you have to keep in mind that you know robert backer when he was first vaunting his theories of uh avian dinosaurs he, he was relatively unknown i mean he was he was known in the field but uh he wasn't a big name by any means and and as i said before he was he was pretty much considered a heretic i mean people were saying this can't be so we don't we don't believe that this is the case so you know it, it the truth will out <laughs> i think of course it's a particular quote here that i that i thought interesting is that uh another a colleague who saw some of the the presentations that De Palma gave at uh, conferences was um, there's an element of showmanship in his presentation style that does not add to his credibility. Because <laughs> I find <laughs> yeah, the lack of transparency okay. and the dramatic aspects of De Palma's personality un- unnerving, which, I mean, is fair. I mean, the guy ter- does show up dressed like Indiana Jones very deliberately. Yeah. But, like, but then again, Robert Backer was accused yeah. of exactly the same things. You know, he was accused of being, you know, overly dramatic and, you know, and he had that, you know, the, the Indiana Jones look and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, yeah, that. That, that just means it the market will try and play the media to get a bit more yeah, yeah, that's right. exposure. Yeah. For sure, things, yeah. exactly. I mean, if you got it, why not? Yeah, exactly. And as I say, you know, he needs all the money and attention that he can get really in terms right. of this uphill battle. So I don't fault him for that No, at and all. I, look, to be honest, a lot I of just... scientific conferences could do with more elements of showmanship. <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah. A bit more personality. Yeah, I feel like that's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the right approach, of course, though, is... A healthy dose of skepticism. Uh, always. This is an exciting uh, possibility, and if it is true, then it is extraordinary. But let's take a suck it and see approach. Let's uh, see if we can find any corroborating evidence. Let's get it peer reviewed, and all. Because I don't think this has been published yet. Uh, I think it's going to be published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, but I'm not sure if that's happened yet. So it will be interesting to see just how the rest of the community responds and how things change over the next decades, sure. really. And De Palma has a bit of lab work to do as well. I mean, there's a certain amount of stuff that's been taken out of the site back to, to the lab for various kinds of examination. So, you know, that's going to probably bring up some new data and some new interesting things as well. Yeah, but I, I also I have to say we've barely, if you forgive the pun we've barely scratched the surface of this <laughs> you really need to read the yeah. article it's it is it's great it is an exciting article isn't it article. Yeah. yeah all right well let's move on to a health story now and it's actually a bit worrying yeah. a study led by a team at the duke university clinical research institute has found that treatment recommendations that u.s doctors use when managing heart patients about less than 10% of those recommendations are based on the best available evidence. And Kate, we're constantly battling anti-vaxxers and pseudoscientific alternative medicines. Yep. 
that don't have any evidence to back them yep. up. So this is a rather alarming headline. Okay. <laughs> What's going on here? Like, I, I saw this and I thought, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. I have all the feelings because I'm not even, like, it's going to make me sound a bit dodgy here, but I'm not actually even remotely surprised. Um, and the reason hmm. is that, um, you know, to give a little bit of background without oversharing, I have, like, a few multiple weird health conditions going on. Um, and it took a little bit of, of digging and faffing around to get everything diagnosed. And it was all, you know, I've got a great medical team and really good specialists and everything's all roses, That's which is nice. But when you're trying to figure this stuff out, and especially when you've got obscure things going wrong and things that interact with other things, you end up diving down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Uh, and you end up discovering that a lot of what is given to you as we just know that's how it works is actually not well supported. And it's a bit worrying as well because when it comes to medical uh, medical information, um, there's a mantle of responsibility that I, as a marine biologist and not a doctor, don't want to take up. Um, but on the other hand, when you do actually look at the literature and you find out where some of these, some of these gaps are, you start to go, oh, dear. Uh, well, that's a, that's a bit of a worry. Um, because the, here's the thing as well, like you argue with the anti-vaxxers not because you expect to change their mind but because you're hoping that other people who don't know as much are going to read the conversation and go, right, okay, so I can tell which side of, of, of this conversation is the sensible side, um, yep. which is, you know, why we do have these conversations and these discussions. And so all we can do is try and be very transparent and very open. And this is something that I feel is an area where um, – the medical community is not necessarily great as a whole, is transparency. Yeah. There's a very much a sense of because I said so. Mm -hmm. um, not from everyone. There are some, like, you know, I like my doctors because they will draw me diagrams when I ask for them, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, but I certainly have heard from plenty of people say, oh, yeah, they told me that it couldn't be this because of this and this. And I'm like, what? But I have mm -hmm. that and that and that. And, you know, it, it's just – it's all a bit it's all a bit worrying. Now, the thing about this heart evidence is that um, we do have a bunch of truisms in, um, in the kind of uh, public health outreach situation which are accepted as basically dogma. Um, and any sort of questioning of it is given a side eye. And that, in the sense, is very, is very sensible because of this – uh, this, this sort of sense of responsibility and duty of care is that if we, if there is something that we feel that we really, really know is going to keep people healthier and save lives and so on, then raising questions about it isn't necessarily a responsible thing to do unless that information is actually wrong, in which case raising questions about it is the responsible thing to do. And so where you come down on this um, is, is, very, is very much a matter of, um, I think, where people have been trained and what they've actually witnessed in patient treatments and interactions and so forth. Um, so to cut down to the chase of the actual article killing question now that I finally get to the point and p p try to sort of see little disclaimers in here, marine biologist. No, you've done not well. Not a doctor. <laughs> um, I'm yep. not surprised because, you know, I ate a really wacky diet that is that, you know, according to this, if this dog, if all this dogma were true, I would be, you know, I'd be you on did. the hard road down to um, a heart attack right now, whereas, you know, I have doctors looking at numbers going, look, you just keep doing what you're doing, we're all good. Um, so what we have is when it comes to um, the level of evidence that su supports a recommendation, uh, a guideline, level A, which is our best level of evidence, it's based on evidence gained from multiple randomized controlled trials, which means people have set out to study it deliberately. So they've randomized patients mm -hmm. into control groups. Um, they've tried to organize things to minimize confounding factors and so forth and so on. Now, we could you know, argue until the cows come home about the quality of those specific randomized controlled trials. And arguments are necessary. So even when you get to level A, sure. there's there's situations where you go, ah, it's multiple studies, but this one had six people in it, or this one had mm -hmm. 25 yeah. people in it, oh. and 13 of them dropped out. Um, so that's 
that's a concern, and I'll get to a particular problem with dropping out in a minute. Um, level B is where you've got one randomized control trial that gave you a pretty solid result or convincing result, I suppose, or a non-randomized study like observational analyses. So, and some of the observational analyses can actually be very, very useful um, because that's where you get really long-term, longitudinal epidemiological data, and it's really, really noisy data, like really noisy. But you can also have huge sample sizes um, because there's a lot of public data that you can get access to do to do those kinds of things. So not terrible. Mm -hmm. And level C is expert opinion. Right. So not actually based on no, any studies, but just... It's a good idea, I guess. Or <laughs> they said, well, that seems about right. Of course, this would happen. Um, you know, of, of course, leeches. Why not leeches? Leeches are great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we'll just refer to level C evidence as leeches. Why not? Um, okay. So, according to the review, a, a team, sorry, uh, I was looking at this, a team from Duke University, I believe, uh, senior author is Renato Lopez. Um, I desperately tried to track down the article, but it's not out yet. Um, right. um, went and with this team analysed the evidence supporting more than 6,300 treatment recommendations that the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association and the European Society of Cardiology issued, which is age... That's a lot of recommendations. It is. It is. <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering if any of them are like just recommendations that say if A, then C, but it's a separate recommendation. If no, no, if A, then if, if not A, then B, um, but I don't know um, how that's actually... Yeah, as you say... Tried to find the paper. The <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and I can't find any information about what actual recommendations they talk about. No, that, and they're uh, going to be evidence -based very or not. careful about how they release that as well. Um, so, anyway, so doctors, um, these treatment standards are what doctors refer to. That's how they make their decisions. So, when your doctor gives you a recommendation, you go, I trust my doctor. My doctor knows more than I do about medical science. You know, it seems like a, like a gimme. Um, and that's true. Your doctor does. But your doctor has learned the medical science from some of these treatment recommendations. And then you start to worry because you go, well, what if my doctor's just been, you know, fed leeches? Let's go with leeches. <laughs> um, but yeah, as a, so one of the lead authors, and this is a, this is a quote, quote that just seems very, very obvious to me, but I'm just going to make a point of it because it's quite dramatic, is patients should have an expectation that the science behind the care they receive is solid and will result in improved outcomes. And well, yes. Um, I agree with that. Yes. That's, I mean, <laughs> but the fact that that has to be stated Right. Yeah. This is a problem that I have. So the progress in reducing cardiovascular mortality has decelerated. And again, this doesn't surprise me. So take, for example, um, the kerfuffle you can have about cholesterol medication. So medication that people take to lower their cholesterol, um, which, and believe me, if anyone wants to leave comments or reply, I'm quite happy to be proven wrong. Marine biologist. <laughs> mm. It has only been shown to be useful in the sense of, you know, um, in the statistical medical guideline sense of reducing um, deaths or admissions um, in A, white middle-aged men, B, who have already had a cardiovascular incident. Mm. They have not yeah. actually been shown to improve the cardiovascular outcomes of any other demographic. Now, Again, might have changed. Um, We're talking the, statins, are you? So, yes, I'm talking yeah. about statins. Yeah. Um, a lot of controversy about it. So. A lot of controversy about statins, a lot of push, because the idea being that, aha, our cholesterol is high and that is bad, is not necessarily supportive of like, but is the cholesterol the thing causing the problem? Mm. Or is the problem actually what might be causing the high cholesterol? Because if all you're doing is lowering lowering the cholesterol, then you've just all you've done is turned off your fire siren. If that makes sense, mm. it doesn't actually stop the fire. You just mm. can't hear the alarm anymore. Um, so that's also not to say that people who are on statins shouldn't take them. Um, it doesn't say that it wouldn't be beneficial for other demographics. It could also be that those other demographics are understudied. For example, women as a target demographic for this kind of study are vastly underrepresented. Um, and that's, that's a real concern as well. Um, 
to be clear, we're giving the example of statins purely as an example example. of how the research can be controversial and there is not necessarily clear-cut evidence either way. We are not giving medical advice here in any shape or form. Thank you. It's it's hard because I think this conversation definitely has to happen. Um, But because there is there is very much a a culture of well if you question this you're going to if you question this information you're going to kill someone but you see they're going well hmm. but if you're wrong and we don't question it yeah. what happens then um and yeah and this is the problem the fact that you've got 41.5 percent apparently of these studies um are level c recommendation which is basically someone thought it was a good idea mm-hmm. And these are things about, and actually these are talking about conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, basic cardiovascular conditions, uh, nutritional advice. Um, And I mentioned dropping out of studies um, earlier in terms of um, the evidentiary basis at level A. So the best level of evidence we talk about, um, nutritional studies are a big problem because people drop out of those studies. And then the sample sizes get small and then they get confounded. And then you can't actually draw a huge amount from them. Um, And nutritional studies are hugely important when it comes to trying to discuss cardiovascular health um, and events. So, yes, basically this article worries me a lot if I didn't, if I, you know, I'm not surprised by it. I am horrified at 90%. Yeah. Like 90% was definitely higher than I would have expected. Um, Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a self-reinforcing mechanism at play, which is upsetting. I sort of wonder if maybe there's a kind of a victim of our own success problem here where we've gotten very good at treating cardiovascular health over the last, you know, three or four decades. And so much of what we know is based on what we've been taught at medical school, for example. And if something is been so well accepted there's not going to be as many tests and studies done on that as there were as you would expect for something new to Mm. come out so things become just established as that's the authority that we know and they don't get tested often enough and uh updated yeah no that's that's very much the case um you sit there and you think well and i can understand the problem you've only got a limited amount of research funds You go, well, I could spend those funds trying to test whether or not salt does actually affect blood pressure. Or I could actually use them to try and solve this particular problem for this disease, which we actually haven't had any progress on. Mm. Um, So, yeah, that's where you you start to wonder, like, who's going to actually pick up the mantle of I'm just going to go test this thing that everyone thinks is already true. Um, And and people do. They do it, but they do it in in a slightly slapdash way. Um, but yeah. That said, I, I want to reiterate what I said before. <laughs> Trust your doctor. No, seriously, b- because articles like this are can potentially be very damaging to uh, the forces of good, if you will. And yeah, uh, and it, it's deeply concerning, as I said, when we're combating the alt uh, med brigade yes. and the uh, anti vaxxers who can then point the finger and go, "Well, all the me- all the doctors are." Uh, pushing stuff that isn't yeah. evidence based. And things no, as no. Well. My, my thing is, so, at least they know more than you. <laughs> and that's where I go with is they know more than me. And that is one of the things. Actually, one history. recommendation that I can make is have a really good doctor. Try and find a GP yep. that you say I'm concerned about this. Where you know what's the situation here? Who will actually say, Oh, let's. I don't know. Let's look that up. Mm. And we'll go away and figure. And it have out. regular checkups, even if there's nothing that you're concerned yes. about. Have a regular checkup yep. anyway. Have a good es- established rapport with your GP, yep. and trust yeah, them and on most occasions. Yeah, because a lot of them will get a second opinion work with things. you and work with the evidence, and will are happy to go away and learn more because they want to give you the right advice. Mm. That's what they yes. want. So that's what I would say to uh, layman's listening to this podcast. If you are a cardiologist or a GP, I would say get your house in order. <laughs> <laughs> because, as I said, it just hurts the cause uh, and the patients. Let's move on and talk robotics and technology. And we've talked before about the uncanny valley, that notion that as computer graphics and robotics get more and more realistic... There's a point where seeing a digital avatar or an android 
can become quite unsettling because it's so realistic. Like it's almost believably a human, but there's just something not quite right and it feels weird. Well, we don't often talk about how that also applies to artificial voices. And as our virtual assistants like Alexa and Google Home and all that, they're getting better and better. And there's something of an uncanny valley there as well, isn't there, Peter? Yeah, so, so we have a situation with, with um, artificial voices um, where they are becoming more and more um, entrenched in the way we do things. And so everyone's kind of used to Siri and Alexa. Um, but quite obviously, these, vo- these are not real voices. And we can tell that they're not re- real voices because they don't quite respond the way that we're accustomed to real voices um, responding and talking and so forth. Um, so some researchers um, at um, MIT have been looking into this and, and what makes voices uh, more or less real and trying to uh, approach what they see as a potential uncanny valley situation with voices. Um, so we have a, a, an AI researcher whose name's Alexandra Przegalinska. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, and she's um, she's an she's an AI researcher, but in recent times she's actually turned her interests to um, how voices uh, can be made to be more real and more human and, and more natural. Uh, and been doing studies uh, with research students and finding that. Uh, there is there, there appears to be a, a kind of version of the uncanny, uncanny valley that happens with voices uh, where people don't accept as a voice gets more and more realistic people stop ex- accepting that it's a robot voice but don't quite accept that it's a human voice so it's quite an interesting uh, study um, and he, she's found in her research that one of the one of the uh, ramifications of it is that people start to get very insulting uh, mm. towards the the artificial, uh, intelligence voices they actually start to abuse them and uh, call, call them names and things like that which is uh, an interesting uh, an interesting phenomenon but I kind of I think I, I associate with that because I quite often do that when I'm trying to get through with Telstra using their uh, automated system <laughs> I say a lot of rude words to the artificial voice so uh, yeah it's it does seem to be something that I'm not sure you can kind of categorize it strictly as the same phenomenon as the uncanny valley with uh, with with visual the visual um, side of things but it does seem to have some things in common that's for certain it also reminded me of another story and i sent you a link to it as well um yeah very interesting uh, so this is a this is an initiative by a, a, a group called equal ai um, for a, a genderless voice and gender neutral voice, which they have been calling Q, uh, and the idea behind this, of course, is that you know this will be a this is the kind of voice that would uh, be used in all contexts. So not a we're accustomed to Siri and Alexa be, as being female voices, and we we hear a lot of female voices, uh, but not so many male voices, um, and so. Uh, uh, Equal AI have, have basically said, well, look, you know, why, why should the voice have a gender at all? It should be a, a completely neutral gendered voice. Uh, so that's, uh, that's and they've started to kind of lobby places like Google to try and get this uh, uh, as an idea that kind of gets introduced into um, various forms of um, appliances. It's fascinating. It's an interesting idea. Um, I think there has been some research that finds... Um, people are more likely to take instruction from female voices and that often male voices can come across as too overbearing or aggressive, mm-hmm. I think. Well, uh, I haven't seen the evidence to really comment on that. Sorry. No, I was just going to say um, the quote in the article about uh, Q, the uh, the gender neutral voice, um, there's a quote that says, there's a history of research that shows often that people might prefer to hear a female sounding voice in some situations particularly when the tasks associated with that voice are assistive, like Siri is very much, how can I help you? What can I do for you? All that sort Mm. of thing. Mm. Um, Or they may prefer, where they need a voice to come from an authority source, like to tell them what to do, they may prefer to hear a male voice, um, Mm. which makes me twitchy. um, (laughs) And and yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, I, I think it's actually a really interesting idea. And I actually think it's a very good, a very good idea just to sort of normalize uh the idea of a, a genderless voice and trying to dissociate those expectations to a certain extent um mm. 
because you don't notice what you're sort of absorbing, no. the expectations that you start to pick up um, from that kind of um, behaviour from your robots and home assistants. Hmm. And of course, when we have when you have uh, Silicon Valley and all these, um, I'm going to say it mostly white, mostly male dominated industries, yep. mm -hmm. there's a huge diversity issue in terms of the voices as well as the, um, all the other permutations that technology has. Uh, and I think the, the, what these, this uh, organization has come up with is Q, the gender neutral voice. And I think it's really interesting what they've come up with. Basically it was by, I think they recorded various people who identified uh, as male, as female, transgender or non-binary. And they sort of focused on aspects of those voices using certain ranges of the um, uh, audio spectrum. Probably, Peter, you'd be better off talking about this than I am. And using ways to make that sound supposedly genuine. Yeah, so, so what they've done is they've chosen, uh, they've chosen a very neutral sounding voice anyway. The, 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 the emotional kind of content is very neutral, but they've also um, chosen a pitch kind of between what we consider to be the average kind of male voice and the average female voice. So it's sort of somewhere between those two things. So it's interesting listening to Q because uh, it, it's quite easy to flip your head back and forwards between thinking this could be a man, it could be a woman. So it's very, very even. It's a very, very even Voice. I noticed that too, and for me, it was it reminded me a lot of the Yanni versus Laurel uh, thing <laughs> yes, that we had earlier. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you might start hearing it at the start, and you think, oh, it's it's a male voice. It, it, it's quite clearly uh, okay, maybe a high pitched, but a male voice nonetheless. And then after a while, you sort of go, oh, actually, no, that does sound female. That's definitely a female voice. And you get to a point like with Laurel and Yanni, where I heard it so many times that I could choose which one I hear at any one point in time. Yeah. It is a it is a very it's it's an interesting thing to, to uh, for them to attempt to do uh, because the the neutrality is is quite um, I think quite profound in the voice it's not just neutral in as much as uh, the gender is concerned but it's kind of neutral in an emotional way as well uh, so so it it is a very neutral voice it's quite interesting um, and to to me a little eerie and a little encroaching on that uncanny valley concept because you're not really quite sure what it is that you're listening to yeah it's that lack of certainty that i think well i mean in that, in that sense bit. it does i mm -hmm. suppose um force you to confront your expectations of a gender binary sure um, right. in the yeah, voices absolutely. that you hear um which you know and i think a little you know a little nudge into self-reflection on these kinds of things is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's not, it's not an unpleasant thing. That's the thing about it. No, it's just, it, it is quite a nice, um, it is a very relaxing, a very uh, neutral thing, a very neutral tone, a very neutral voice, um, and kind of even slightly friendly, I think, if you were going to assign some form of emotion to it. It does feel quite approachable. So I think really they're onto something quite profound with that. I think it's a, it is actually a great idea. Well, maybe it could, and I'm just spitballing here, but maybe it could help with that issue of the uncanny valley when it comes to um, robotic voices, is mm -hmm. that if, you, if you're if you pushing it well enough into say, okay, well, we're not expecting, we're not really expecting this to sound mm. like people that we talk to every day necessarily. This is now falling into a category where you can't assign it to what we've grown up to expect. Sure, and there's a, there, there is actually a, a, a sort of a, a movement in robotics to, to think that, you know, it's not right to be trying to make robots that look like human beings, uh, perhaps a sort of a futile exercise anyway. And if you're going, and so therefore, you know, we know that there's going to be a robot, it should not try and conform to the expectations of being a human. Uh, and so it's possible that that same kind of philosophy is, is quite um, reasonable when it comes to voice as well. Uh, which, why should it why should it sound like a human? It, we, we know that it's not. So, um, you know, that's an expectation thing. Um, yeah. But it's a really intriguing one too because I've uh, been in uh, people's homes where their kids will say, you know, Alexa, show me this or whatever, and then they'll say, thank you, Alexa. <laughs> and they're polite yeah. to the lady in the box. Hey, look, I've always, I was always polite to the photocopy machine in our high school <laughs> library because then I knew it would give me my photocopy card back. 
<laughs> say thank you. Yeah, I'm not so I'm not so Can't polite to, to and, and, robots. And Peter's quite aggressive I, I, to the, the machine voice. I hate person. them. I, I hate oh no, them. the machine. I hate voice them. Voice. Yeah, I hate them because they are so incompetent. So I've, I've often <laughs> said, you know, like the the the, the artificial uh, servants that they have at Telstra are worse than if you just. It's like going out and picking a random person off the street and saying, do you, do you want to be the person who is the front for, for our organisation and sit at our front desk? Whereas you it's like, what? <laughs> um, there, is, there is a very real uh, problem, though, when it comes to the ability of these voice-activated these voice activated technologies. And so coming on the other end, not so much how they sound, but how they react to voices yeah. um, in that. And I apologise if you've already discussed this on Science on Top, but the discovery that... Um, a lot of voice activated systems will react to a deeper voice but won't respond correctly to a more high pitched voice so then you end up with um, with safety issues for example if people have got some sort of voice assisted technology in their car and the women are saying do this do this and they couldn't get it to respond and they had to get like their husband to talk to it and that is another problem coming yeah. back from that um, probably that issue in the development of those technologies is not even thinking about how no. it would it's, expect that. It's complex. I mean, it's like the, yeah. it's like the, it's like the accent problem. And we all, we all oh, have that experience where my phone you know, does not uh, understand my accent. Yeah. It's expecting you to have an American accent. So AI in that respect is still very primitive and, and the understanding the, the methods of understanding voice, interpreting voice, whilst they are that much better than they used to be, uh, there's still a lot, to you know, to, to process with that stuff, and I think there's we're still a really long way from having uh, those kinds of voice recognition technologies that are reliable most of the time. Yeah, they've got a they've got a way to go with stuff, yeah. you know, before it becomes you know a really useful technology. And I think you know it's not for want of trying. They they really do un they understand that this would be an incredible thing, but I think they um, you know the AI problem is much greater than, than most people uh, understand it to be. It's very difficult to get the kind of processing that we just do naturally, and evolution has enabled us to do. It's hard to get that in a machine. It's I, I will be honest that I am still stunned by what we have now. Like, uh, I'm still amazed yeah, that we've come this remarkable. far. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But also the fact that there is still a long way to go in this sort of a thing, is all the more reason why we need to be talking about these issues of diversity and of how uncanny valley and how we relate to technology mm -hmm. because once we've got it perfect that's when it's too late <laughs> to establish social yeah. norms which is yeah. what we're really talking that's about true. Here. so having so, those conversations about accent and gender and accessibility yeah. and so forth are really a big deal yeah all right, well, let's now finish up and talk about something that maybe isn't such a big deal, but hey, it's hey. still kind of cool. <laughs> I want to talk about pumpkin toadlets. I love I these. Dro I drop them into conversation every opportunity. I get. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'd be easy to drop. They're only about 15 millimetres long. These are tiny little uh, frogs. I don't know why they're called toadlets when they're frogs. Maybe, Kate, you can tell us about that. I will be um, honest. I looked it up. Because I've there's a there's a lot of the uh, herpetology people uh, that work in the DNA lab up at the museum where I do all my genetic stuff, and I've never once heard them use the word toadlet. So I've just gone, what the hell is this? Is just, <laughs> and it turns out it is in fact a small toad. Yeah. That's it. There no, no. there is no there is no but, secret biological not frogs. Yeah. So these pumpkin toadlets are they frogs or well, are pumpkins. they to they're small toads? <laughs> Definitely not pumpkins. <laughs> they're toads. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Well, there. Well, toads are a type of frog. Ah. Oh, jeez. Oh, Don't even ask me about turtles and tortoises. I'm just going to destroy your childhood. Uh. I, did, I did not know that. I've learned something today. I've said it many, many times on this show. Taxonomy is really hard. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> and everything I thought I knew is wrong. That also comes up That's a lot. Um, okay. So these tiny, 15 millimeter long toadlets. They're poisonous. They're found in Brazil's Atlantic forest. But the really cool and weird thing is that their skeletons are fluorescent under UV light. Is that right? Thank you, thank you, for, thank you for not saying glowing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not technically fair. They do glow under UV light. 
Um, but there is a difference between actually giving off light and reflecting um, uh, fluorescing under UV. Um, giving off light is where we start to talk about bioluminescence, and that's when you've got your, um, you know, your symbiotic bacteria or you've got particular uh, proteins that you release that actually emit light. Um, in this case, this, is, this isn't uh, what they're expecting. They just happened to stick the little frogs under UV light. Uh, they normally, obviously, they're called pumpkin. That's why they're orange, red, or yellow. Very cute, very tiny. And they were investigating their mating call. I'm just sitting here. I have a little ruler on my desk. You know, like 15 millimetres. That's really, really little. It is quite small. It's, it's very small. small. How do they even make a mating call? It's just, just, they use a very large horn. I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, if anything's okay. going to deserve the title of a toadlet as opposed to being a toad, I mean, this, yeah, this is oh, highly yeah. fair. It's a lip. It's definitely yeah. a lip. Yeah, so they, um, so they shone the UV lamp on the frogs and saw that blue patterns were emerging on the toadlet's head, back and legs. Now, I'm just going to cite note here and say I don't know why you, when you're investigating mating calls you used to say, you know what, I'm yeah. just sticking under a UV lamp to shit some giggles. How bored must they have been? It's like, you know what, we've got this so UV lamp. It could have been, been in lab cleaning because UV lamps are really useful when you're cleaning up the lab for stuff that you need to tidy oh, okay. up. That's, just, that's the theory off the top of my head. Um, and just got oh, that's not normally shiny. Um, but so what they found is that the the they glow blue on their backs and heads, uh, sorry, heads, backs and legs in response to UV light. But their actual entire skeleton does this. Like mm. I'm assuming they would have had to get a bit up close and personal mm. with the skeleton question, which is very Dark sad um, to discover this. But it's only visible in those particular. Um, locations because the skin there is so thin um, that you can see the skeleton fluorescing. Um, Now, the question is, they're not entirely sure why they would do this. Now, it's not, you know, it's not a completely energetically neutral uh, practice. So what would sustain Mm. this in terms of evolution? So there's a couple of theories and... One, there's a, you know, they could be using it to communicate with each other, and we don't know if frogs can see UV. Um, so that's mm. plausible, I suppose, uh, particularly because, and this is weird, they have mating calls. They don't have a middle ear. They can't hear the calls. So that's just it. Does, that's just does anyone, yeah, they mate. can't hear themselves what? calling. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> how they use them, unless that literally means that, because I'm not an audiologist, I'm probably missing some things here, unless that actually means that they simply can't hear their own calls. Yeah, so they can hear the calls of other toilets, but they can't hear themselves. Anyway, I thought that was a very odd thing and I needed to bring it up. Um, So I would understand if they needed a bit of extra help to communicate. Um, But what seems to be a little bit more likely is that because the frogs have this toxic coating, um, I think from what I can see, um, Brazil is a little bit like Australia in that most of the wildlife does, in fact, want to kill <laughs> um, And the glow acts as an extra warning uh, oh, because right. a, lot of, a lot of birds and spiders can see fluorescence in natural uh, light. Birds um, particularly, yeah. So it's like, yeah. don't eat me. Don't eat yep. me. Yeah, no, really, bad idea. Um, yeah. I may look small and delicious and like, pump, like a tiny pumpkin, but no. Um, no, because I, I do remember even as far back as, uh, you know, first year botany when they're, te- you know, showing us pictures of the flowers and flower structures and so forth, and they showed it to us under UV light. And you could yeah. actually see little landing pads yeah. for the pollinators to, you know, come yeah. here, land here. It was almost like a, like a little trail of breadcrumbs um, that was completely invisible to our inferior human eyesight. Um, well, at least not without the evidence of, without the assistance of the UV light. Um, and so it does seem quite plausible that there's just an extra layer of warning off, warning right. something off. And it, you know what? It seems, I can't imagine that it's that much more energetically demanding than producing brightly coloured pigments. Um, so and, a, lot of yeah. the, a lot of frogs in, in those areas are very kind of vividly patterned as well, aren't they? So in the, in, in the visual spectrum. So, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I reckon. These are fairly bright yeah. orange. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. I'll buy so, that. I'll buy that one. Yeah. So, but yeah, I'm, I mean, personally, I love the fact that they have these fluorescing skeletons that you can see through their skin and that they're tiny and cute. That's amazing. I'm still stuck on the fact that they're making calls they can't hear. Yeah. 
15 millimeters. That's really, really tiny. You're stuck on the size. I'm stuck on this, this desk. That's tiny. How do, they even, how do they even find them? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, now it's easier. Like, it's yeah. V-Light. <laughs> no, they won't be able to see a thing among all the flowers. Yeah, <laughs> true. Uh, it's, it's just bizarre. I think nature is weird and wonderful, and that's a further example of Basically, that. Basically, evolution, if it, if it works, don't, don't knock it. We'll just keep it, see what happens. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Um, as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes on the web at scienceontop.com slash 330. And seriously, go on, click the link and have a look at that New Yorker article about the dinosaurs because so it is, it's a long read, but it's yeah, worth get it. Get like a cup it's of tea really, really or something good. and a bicky and sit down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely bathtub reading. <laughs> Don't drop your laptop. But, but yeah, not your, not with your iPad. No. Nah, just be careful. <laughs> and when you've read that, you can also go to scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us make the show. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kate Norton. Oh, thank you for having me. And Peter Miller. Always great to have you back. Thank you, Ed. It's always a pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Hi, I'm Q, the world's first genderless voice assistant. Think of me like Siri or Alexa, but neither male nor female. I'm created for a future where we are no longer defined by gender, but rather how we define ourselves. My voice was recorded by people who neither identify as male nor female and then altered to sound gender neutral, putting my voice between 145 and 175 hertz, a range defined by audio researchers. But for me to become a third option for voice assistance, I need your help. Share my voice with Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And together we can ensure that technology recognizes us all. Thanks for listening, Q.